Hello, bearded bee people. Welcome back to Bean K Bees for the first part of our beekeeping crash course. Um, so this is going to have many iterations, many parts. I, it's not necessarily for beginners or for people who know nothing. It's just sort of a condensed version, beekeeping in a nutshell, of everything I think useful and interesting when it comes to European honeybees and beekeeping in our modern era. So this first portion, uh, which will include many videos, uh, at least three or four, um, is going to be on honeybee biology. This first video is going to be on honeybee casts, uh, the life cycle, larval development or development periods and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to follow along, I will have the slides, the whole presentation on our website at bkbs.com. Otherwise, I'll be piping in uh, you know, footage from both this uh, computer and the camera that I'm looking at right now. So you should be able to follow along with or without these slides. Uh, so yeah, let's get right into it. Like I said, this is Honeybee Biology, part one, um, casts, life cycle, development and all that. So let's get started. So life cycles, casts, and pheromone communication. I forgot one of the three major portions of this presentation. So pheromone communication is super interesting, super useful, so we'll talk about that as well. <clears throat> okay, so the four stages of development for most insects, but for uh, honeybees as well, are egg, larva, pupa, and then the adult bee. Um, the differences between workers and drones and stuff we'll get into in a little bit. Um, let's see, this is Ben Watson. Ben Watson's daughter decided uh, that she wanted to help, and this didn't work for our presentation to the local bee club, but I think that that was internet connectivity issues, so hopefully this should work uh, now for us. So she'll tell us a little bit about the four stages of development for the European honeybee. Oh, here's the egg. Ah! Here's the larva. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Matt. Hello. And here's the pupa. Then it becomes a bee. <laughs> oh, I love that. So, as you heard her say, it was an egg, and then it was a larva, then it was a pupa, and then it emerges as an adult bee. So, there are differing amounts of time that each type of bee spends in each of these stages. Um, that everything except for the egg. Uh, so the queen, the worker, and the drone all spend three days as an egg, and then after that, there's sort of a race to final development. That race is always won by the queen. There's sort of evolutionary advantages to that. In a lot of cases, uh, a queen needs to be created quickly, um, but also there's sort of just a direct result of the diet that has a lot to play uh, with how quickly a queen develops. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. So they all spend three days as an egg. Uh, the queen spends five and a half uh, days as a larva, the worker about six, and then a drone about seven days. The, for the pupa, here there's a large difference. Uh, the queen only spends just slightly more than a week, seven and a half or so days as a pupa, the worker a full 12 days, and then the drone two solid weeks, two weeks as a pupa underneath the cap. Um, so the total time to development for a queen is 16 to 18 days. That can vary for a couple of different reasons. Um, and then for a worker, it's usually right around 21 days and a drone takes 24 days to develop from the egg laid to an adult drone walking around. And now here we see uh, a picture of the three honeybee casts. Um, the most familiar being the leftmost one, the worker. Uh, we see a lot of those. If you're uh, a beekeeper or not, these are the, the bees that you see most often right here on the left. Um, and then the queen in the middle. You can notice that she's longer, she's more slender than the drone. Her face and thorax looks uh, very similar to the worker. 
and we'll get into why that's the case later on. And then we've got the drone over here on the right. The big thing to notice, the differences between the two to notice here are the shorter, stouter behind and these big old eyes that touch right in the middle of the top of the head. Uh, so if you're new into finding queens, you will find a lot of drones. Um, and if you're unsure, just look at those eyes. If they're touching and they're big uh, up on the top of the head, then you're likely looking at a drone. If it looks uh, more similar to a worker's head and thorax with the eyes having a little bit of separation between them, then you're likely looking at a queen. Um, that period where you're unsure will only last a little long, or a little while, uh, and before long you'll, you'll be ignoring the drones uh, readily and, and the queen will pop out to you very easily. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about each cast of bee. The queen is a diploid bee, and what that means is she has genetic information from both her mother and her father. She's got chromosomes that come from uh, both her mother and her father. She's differentiated from workers when she's fed only larva. I, I think it's a, a better way to say it is that workers are differentiated from queens when workers are fed something different than royal jelly. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit a couple more times throughout this presentation. But the, the queen is only fed royal jelly throughout her entire larval development and the workers are fed uh, something different after a couple days that is essentially pollen and bee bread. Um, and that difference in diet and along with a couple of other things uh, is what brings us a queen as opposed to a worker. So the major purpose for the queen is to lay brood for the growth of the colony, but there are other uh, purposes as well. She's sort of the linchpin. Her uh, queen mandibular pheromone is, uh, is the linchpin for a colony. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, as we go throughout this presentation as well. So yeah, this is the singular most important bee to each bee colony, the honey bee queen. All right, now we'll talk about a drone. Drones are haploid organisms, so that means that they only have one set of genetic information. Um, so they do not have a father. They do have a grandfather, but they don't have a father. They only have genetic information from their mother because she lays unfertilized eggs that result in drones. So we call those haploid bees. The major purpose for a drone and the really only purpose for a drone is to mate with a virgin queen. They do not uh, contribute in any way to the development of the colony. They're only really a drain on resources. So therefore, they're only created, they're only reared and accepted in the colony during the mating portion of the year, and even then, only when resources allow. So they, the bees know that drones are not going to help the colony's success overwintering or uh, doing any other thing. They're only gonna help to spread the genetics of that colony uh, to future colonies uh, by mating with virgin queens in the drone congregation area. And lastly, but very much not leastly, uh, we have the worker bee. The worker bees are diploid, meaning once again that they have uh, genetic information from both their mother and their father, and they are differentiated from queens when they're fed a different diet after the first couple of days, meaning nectar and, uh, and bee bread. So their major purpose is literally everything that isn't laying brood or mating with a queen. Every other thing is done by these worker bees, uh, and they have divided jobs based on age that we'll get into, I think, in the next slide. So Ben did the beginning of this presentation, and I know that he looked and looked and looked for a definitive set of or source of information um, or a definitive set of information that was agreed upon by, def by numerous different sources for how long a bee would spend in each job. So he was unable to find specific agreed upon times, so therefore we're gonna call them loosely age-related. Um, so when a worker bee emerges from her cell, very first thing you're going to notice is that she's lighter, she it looks weak, um, you might mistake her for being a diseased bee. So what that means is her exoskeleton hasn't hardened yet and she's not fully matured quite yet. But after a few hours, uh, she will be ready to start work. And that first job that she will do is uh, she will be a nurse bee. 
So that means she'll be cleaning cells and feeding brood and capping cells and feeding the queen. Um, everything that has to be done inside the brood nest uh, is done by the youngest bees in the hive. After that, she'll graduate to a job called house bees, which is pretty much everything else inside the colony that doesn't have to do with the brood. So that includes guarding the entrance of the hive, and that includes gathering nectar and pollen from foragers and then putting it where it needs to go, uh, ventilating the hive, um, concentrating nectar into honey, all of the jobs, once again, that don't have to do, ha don't have to deal with brood are done by house bees, uh, and wax secretion is another one. So these are wax-aged bees. There, there's a specific age where bees uh, produce wax, and um, that's one of the interesting reasons as to why reproductive swarms are so great for producing wax is because they have a bunch of house bees, a bunch of that particular aged bees in those types of swarms. Um, so after the house bees, they'll graduate to forager bee duty. And uh, you'll, you'll see this actually at about two or three in the afternoon on a nice sunny day. You can walk out to your hives and see bees flying around in concentric circles around the hives. Um, you'll, at the very beginning of your beekeeping career, mistake this for swarming, um, but once you see an actual swarm, you'll realize that that's not the case at all. Um, what they're actually doing is orientation flights. So those are house bees that, have, that are in the process of graduating to forager duty, becoming familiar with their surroundings and becoming familiar enough to where that they can go out searching for food and water and uh, come back to the right spot. So yeah, like I said, we call those orientation flights, and that is the evidence of forager bees uh, just starting their, their job as foragers. So they, as this says here, co collect nectar, pollen, propolis, and water for the colony. <clears throat> okay, so uh, pheromone communication in honeybees is fascinating. Obviously, these bees aren't talking to each other uh, audibly the way we do. Um, they do have uh, a couple of different dances and some touch uh, communication that happens inside the hive, but for the most part, all communication is done through pheromones. And uh, there are a bunch of different pheromones, and they do different things. They signal different things to these bees, and we'll talk about them here. So the first, and in my opinion, most important pheromone for a honeybee colony is the queen substance, or what I call the QMP, the queen mandibular pheromone. So this is the linchpin of a colony in the sense that it, uh, it keeps a colony deciding that, that they have one goal, and that is to work for their queen, to work to help their queen spread her genetics uh, and, and create more bees. When that queen mandibular pheromone dips, uh, that's when bees will start supersedure procedures and, and, or preparation, and, and that's when stuff starts to happen. It can, it can instigate swarming and supersedures and all that kind of stuff. So the queen substance, a, 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 a large amount of queen mandibular pheromone inside a hive is good, and that is the linchpin to the colony. Um, it keeps the worker bees ovaries from developing uh, with that pheromone around them. They know they should not in any way try to lay eggs. They should assist their either sister or mother, depending on you know how old they are, uh, to help her create babies. Um, we'll talk about why that is the case later on in the honeybee mating and genetics portions. But either way, the queen mandibular pheromone is the linchpin to a bee colony. It dwindles over the course of a queen's life and is one of the main criteria for deciding how good their queen is. <clears throat> Outside of the hive, it says it keeps swarms together and uh, may attract drones on mating flights. So, worker pheromones. Um, worker pheromones have a few different, there are a few different types of worker pheromones and they have a, diff, or a, a few different uses. Uh, the first listed here are the alarm pheromones and these are given off when something is intruding into the hive or just something is going wrong. There's something that needs to be dealt with, somebody needs to be 
pushed away from this colony. They'll start to produce uh, isopentyl acetate, which is something that smells quite like bananas or banana oil or banana Laffy Taffy is the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, and you'll smell that if you ever get stung in the face. Unfortunately, <laughs> as it says here on the slide, uh, yeah, I've been stung on the face and I've definitely smelled what really smells like banana Laffy Taffy. The other one is produced by the worker bee's mandibular pheromone, and that is another one that is uh, meant to promote stinging on an intruder or something that is, that is causing a problem for the bees. Um, so the, the next one is neat because it smells like lemongrass oil. You can smell it off of a bee package or a swarm really, really easily. And you can use this smell to entice swarms to any boxes that you may have. Um, so that is the Nasanoff pheromone. And um, it, it, the bees give it off right at the base of their butt. They'll fan their wings and open up this gland. And uh, it really, really helps their sisters, their, their family, to locate, whether that's uh, in a time of chaos, like the hive got knocked over, or whether they are swarming, or any other number of different reasons as to why. Oh, and another one is when a queen leaves on a mating flight, uh, the worker bees will come out onto the baseboard and fan their knees and off gland so that when she's returning, she will have a scent to follow uh, to show up to the right spot. So like I said, that smells incredibly like lemongrass oil, and it is used by many, many people as a swarm lure. You can do that uh, by putting a little drop of it on a cotton ball, and then putting that cotton ball in a plastic bag, cutting a tiny slit in that plastic bag, put it in a box and put it outside, and you will greatly increase your chances of catching a wild swarm, because once again, that lemongrass oil smells quite a lot like their Nasanoff pheromone, which is sometimes referred to as the come-hither pheromone. So come on over here, we found a good spot. All right, so next pheromone is drone pheromone. Um, there, it says likely plays a role in drone congregation areas. We know that drone congregation areas stay in the same spot year after year after year. So it's definitely not only uh, drone pheromones that create these things. Somehow they're persisting uh, throughout generations of bees. So we don't know 100% what causes drones to congregate in specific areas, but likely drone pheromones play some role in that. And then lastly, uh, once again, but not leastly, uh, we've got brood pheromone. And I say not leastly because uh, this is an important one. It, as is stated here, can signal the house bees and nurse bees to do various things like feed or cap the cell, or cannibalize it if there's a disease or if it's a, a haploid, uh, or I mean a diploid drone. Um, but another reason as to why brood pheromone is so important is because along with the queen mandibular pheromone, brood pheromone inhibits the worker bee's ovaries from developing. So what that means is that if you have a queenless colony, like in my cell builders every year, I have all these bees in a box with no queen, and that is fine until a point where the worker bees start laying eggs. Well, in these cell builders, I'm constantly giving them open brood, open milk brood, and that brood pheromone is enough to keep the workers from having their ovaries develop and starting to lay eggs. Um, so yeah, the there are uh, uh, multiple different uh, reasons for brood pheromone, multiple different things that it is used for by the bees. Um, and like I said, it is uh, one of the important ones to understand, at least in terms of um, keeping laying workers at bay. Okay, and so here we've got a slide that shows the various glands that produce these pheromones got the hypopharyngeal gland up here, the mandibular gland that is the producer of the queen mandibular pheromone and uh, in workers and produces an alarm pheromone. You've got the wax glands down here on their underside. If you've ever seen bees produce wax, they've got big old plates of perfectly white wax that they push out on the underside of their abdomen. And then the nasanoff gland, as I said, right there sort of at the base of their butt. You've got their sting and their poison gland down here. 
Um, so like I said, this stuff will be on bkbs.com and fremontareabeekeepers.org. So if you want to check this out after this video, uh, head over there and that will be available to you. <clears throat> All right, so this is the bibliography. Once again, this portion of this was put together by my good friend Ben Watson. So thank you very much to Ben and his family for their help on this. Um, and here's the, the bibliography if you want to check out any of his sources. Uh, but yeah, so please, you know, pay attention, stay tuned for the next part. The next part will be on um, honeybee mating and genetics. Uh, I mean, just crazy interesting stuff. So I hope uh, you'll follow me along throughout this crash course. There's so much more information as we go forward. So once again, thank you very much, Ben Watson. Thank you very much, everyone out there for watching these videos. I hope you enjoy them. Uh, and if it's not freezing cold and sideways snow, get out there and have some fun with your bees. See ya.